You want to test it some more? Or? Okay. So you might you might get some output. You might cycle back. You might rework your model. You might read a whole bunch of documentation. Here's some online documentation screenshot. You might go back to the signal extraction part, the data cleaning part, whatever it is. You might read some more documentation, and you kind of do this kind of very lo long arch loop, right? As you're trying to basically ask and answer a fundamentally statistical question, right? That's just a fact, right? Um, so, you know, the, the, the inherent kind of glaring thing that stares at you is that most of the time is spent away from the original problem, right? You're really mostly thinking about engineering or software or whatever tools that you're using or whatever interface you're using. There are only a few parts of this story where that's fundamentally statistical, where you're asking a question in statistical machine learning lexicon and you're getting an answer in that lexicon and then you're using that information to feed back into some sort of further actions, right? And these are sort of the parts there, the original idea, whatever the problem that is that you're posing, maybe some of the data cleaning extraction parts have it, maybe not, that's debatable, and then certainly the output, right? Um, that's telling you whether or not you're doing something right or wrong. So, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the thing that begs the question is like, can we do better than that, right? And what does better really mean? And, and what do we care fundamentally when we do all of this, right? So, realistically speaking, fundamentally, for the most part, I think we care about answering a question that is statistical, right? Or a question that is, machine learning or AI or whatever that is. And, and we should hopefully find a way at some point to be able to focus on that question more, right? So what would that take, right? And, and if we want to think about what that would take, we're really going to be able, to, we're really going to start to think about sort of representation and abstraction of the actual objects we're working with, right? So if we want to build a system that is kind of fully statistical from a semantic standpoint, we need to start thinking about the sort of language and the lexicon and the, uh, and the representational abstraction that we're going to create about that, around that world, and then see if we can somehow implement that, right? So it really can become a question of abstraction, it can really become a question of representation, almost a question of linguistics in some sense, right? So why is that sort of worthwhile? Well, so, you know, when we think of abstraction in general, sort of if we go down to its roots, or if we think of semantic representation, sort of the power of that comes from the, f the baseline fact that we might have some idea, right? There's some stuff happening in the wet matter, in our heads, whatever it is, like some sort of neurophysiological process, and we're able to formulate that neurophysiological process through some sort of semantic representation. That is inherently like a powerful step in, in, in cognitive, evolution, realistically speaking, right? So we should be aware of this happening, right? So, and, and the kind of idea that, that ends up coming out of this is the fact that whatever this abstraction is, right? Whatever it is that we're doing, it's generally not defined within the paradigm of the original language that we start with, right? So for example, you know, I might think of a mathematical theorem and write it down in English and then that might be translated to some sort of abstraction in a mathematical symbolic reasoning sense, right? And then worked forward so we can talk about that. And we'll see some examples of that. But the symbolic representation part is kind of spectacular because what ends up happening is that you're able to maybe have a thought, you have a representation of that thought in the semantic paradigm, and then you have um, a symbolic representation, whether that's writing, whether that's pictures, whether that's some sort of interface, whether it's objects, whatever it is, but the great thing about that is that you're able to then kind of think about that, right? I can take an idea, I can verbalize that idea, I can write that idea down, like the fundamental original problem in statistics that I posed maybe at the beginning of that diagram, and then I can think about it, right? And then I can discuss it, and then I can potentially see the structure of that idea, of that thing, through its very representation fitting into some other bigger structure and bigger realm in, in the world, right? We do this all the time. That's how science, for the most part, works, right? That's the fundamental idea of 
cybernetics, for example, or, or a lot of the original ideas of, of what was called AI back in the 50s and 60s. Right? We're really thinking about this symbolic representation that is going to be able to abstract an information processing kind of world. Right? And, and the thing that, that's, that we, we fundamentally gravitate through that is what Brett Victor, and if you haven't heard of Brett Victor, you should go look him up, um, has really refers to as thinking the unthinkable, right? right? That's kind of the great kind of next step of sort of cognitive evolution is that you're able to have this representation that you're able to discuss, and then you can abstract structure from it. You can relate different branches of science. You can relate structure across the world. You can think of ask questions like, are neural nets actually somehow related to neurophysiology, right? That's inherently a question that requires this entire process to have gone through, right? You've already abstracted it, right? So the thing to, to kind of fundamentally underline is the fact that language is, is really the primary tool for this, language combined with other things, right? So, um, but before we get to these other things, the the sort of utility of this language when it, when it is in, worked in conjunction with something like writing, or with something like a computer, or with something like programming, or with something like, you know, an interface to a machine, becomes only worthwhile if we can sort of attain a certain form of literacy, right? That's what literacy really means to us. It's, it's really the ability to, um, to go beyond the mechanics of the tool and go beyond the mechanics of the abstraction that you're dealing with, right? So this has all been kind of pseudo high level, but, but just think about what I'm saying, right? If you are forever forced to think about how to write, you will never write anything worthwhile, right? If the, if the act of writing and the act of reading is so um, complicated or convoluted or so devoid of literacy, then you will never be able to come up with something that requires writing, right? You'll never write a sonnet. You'll never write a book. You'll never write anything, really. You'll just think about the writing part, right? So there is, that's what I mean by literacy there. And it's not, it's not kind of a facetious, you know, co-option of the, of, the of the actual word. I think that, that it applies in general, right? It applies wherever we think of semantic semantics and, 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 and symbolic logic and symbolic representations and, and tools and so on. So here's like a very classical example, uh, I guess without the pun, right? So this is sort of, this is the statement out of Euclid's elements uh, the, uh, of the Pythagorean theorem that we all know very well, right? And if we read it the way it's stated right there, you know, in right angle triangles, the square on the sides subtending the right angle is equal to the squares on the sides containing the right angle. And that makes sense, but it's certainly probably not what you had in your head to begin with when I said Pythagorean theorem, right? It took a while for people to do, go from there to something like this, right? And all we're really saying there is that, you know, the areas of A and B, those squares, subtending lines A and B uh, are equal in sum equal the area of the square subtending C. But there's a fundamental difference in how you can think about the first version versus the second version, right? There's a fundamental utility in this visual representation there. It's engaging, uh, 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 you know, the visual cortex part of your mind. It's making you think of purely geometry as opposed to trying to translate this kind of convoluted language into the picture first, right? And, and even more so, there's another way to think about it, which is probably what you did to begin with when I said Pythagorean theorem the, is, is completely symbolically, right? Completely algebraic. And, and the power of that, which took <coughs> some time to, to come around, right? This is not something that was around, uh, you know, for millennia. This is, not, this is something that we really have to our liking for only a few hundred years. The power of that is that probably that you even thought that first, right? And then went backwards and reproduced that picture and totally forget, forgot about the original formulation or any sort of English semantic linguistical, you know, explana expletive explanation of the entire thing, right? So, so there, is, there is an inherent power of that. The other power of that that comes from is that it's inherently algebraic and you can think about equations. 
which you could not think about when you started with that. There is nothing about equations that's like glaring at you there. And then you can think about algebra, and then you can think about other branches of mathematics, and then you can think about whatever, right? And that's sort of the reason that you have hundreds of proofs of the Pythagorean theorem branching all over mathematics, is si simply because that there's a reasonable symbolic sort of representation of these things. There's a reasonable way to abstract them and to think about them, right? And I don't want to go too deep into this, but, I, but what I want to sort of allude to right now, and I'll kind of get into more specifics in a little bit, is that I think we're missing some of that when we think about machine learning and the tools we use. And thinking about this fundamentally that way could potentially open doors to new ways or more structured, coherent, and intelligent ways to do the work that we're doing on a daily basis. And a lot of this certainly applies beyond machine learning. It's just a convenient, it's a convenient area for all of us to have this conversation, right? We can have this conversation about anything we want from, from document management systems to your own email, right? We can do whatever, right? But this is, but this is certainly at the heart of, of all of these things, right? So um, with that said, I'm gonna play a little clip of another talk from Alan Kay, and if you don't know Alan Kay, like Brett Victor, please do look him up, and he is one of the fathers of the personal computer and much of what we know. He was at Xerox Park in the 60s with a half a dozen other guys, all of whom together in four years basically invented the internet, the graphical user interface, the personal computer, the laser printer, which is the only thing Xerox realized it was gonna capitalize on, it kind of forgot about all the other things, and a whole bunch of other kind of realities that we live in today. So I'm gonna play a few minutes from, from Alan Kay talking, and then we'll go from there. Can you hear that? Not really. 
right, so let me put this on. So the, the thing to kind of take away from there is that, is that we have to be, there's kind of two major takeaways, right? There are like these three kind of natural um, contexts that we deal with, right? The interactive, the visual, and the symbolic, right? And there's no inherent power to either one of them, right? They should all kind of work in conjunction. And there's no reason to think that one is somehow going to be better than the other. The other takeaway is that kind of we tend to gravitate towards symbolic, right? Sort of when you thought of the Pythagorean theorem and I then expounded about how great a representation that was in terms of kind of symbolic algebra, that might not have been a great representation when you think about operational significance, when you think about actually doing something. Maybe that wasn't optimal at all, right? It was potentially optimal if you think about mathematics as a whole or whatever, right? So it's something to think about. So when we go back to the original problem and I like, I'm not offering any solutions here to any of the questions I raised, but I do like to show things, right? So as opposed to just talk. So if we were to go back to the original problem of, of that we posed about building some sort of a classifier over some sort of a data set, right? In that long flow of stuff that looped back, we could ask the fundamental question of, well, how do we want the language or the tool slash language combination, conjunction to work if we're going to be married to say Python Scalar or some other uh, statistical machine learning library slash system. What do we want it to even look like, to feel like, and, and, and to be like? So why not, let me see if I can jump forward here. Why not have it look something like this, right? This isn't the entire, this isn't all of Scalar, but this is pretty much most of the major classifiers. So, okay, it's cute, it's a picture, right? We'll see it's a picture that has more uh, operational significance than just the picture itself. We will do stuff with this picture in a few minutes, but at least from the get-go, we have kind of a language to work with, right? We can ask questions about this right away. We can say, oh, these classes of classifiers fit into a certain structure that we might not have seen a priori had we not studied statistics enough and thought, read enough documentation from SKLearn, right? You can ask fundamental questions like what's missing there, right? In, in this sort of Mendeleev periodic table of elements, there's, you know, what is the equivalence or maybe it's completely facetious and there is no equivalence to the atomic weight. To what, what, how should we organize all of this? How should we look at that API, right? Now maybe this will go nowhere but at least we can fundamentally ask those questions, right? And, and then and see where, where they'll go. And hopefully I can show you that it can go somewhere. So, um, so let's define something, just for the, for, the tack, for the sake of this talk. Let's define an abstraction as useful if it allows for higher level meta formulation of an underlying symbolic system and is really relatively optimal for attainment of literacy, right? So I'm sure that people who have if there's anyone here who's an expert in cybernetics or an expert in linguistics, you'll probably, or even neurophysiology, you'll probably throw your hands up and there's many things wrong with this definition, but, uh, but let's just take it for the sake of, of this talk, right? So we're, you know, we're gonna, the, the, the sort of takeaway from the definition is that we wanna think of these high order utilitarian entities that are these tools that are built on symbolic representations and sort of the language that we're trying to create. So, you know, when we think about these tools, right, if we want to think about tools in general, um, we kind of fall into two categories. We think of tinkering tools, right? We understand what tinkering means, experimentation, like quick kind of feedback, breaking things, putting things together. And we think of engineering tools. Now, what I really mean is, I mean engineering, not software engineering, right? We, we, we can have a, an entire, seminar on whether software engineering has anything to do with engineering or what parts of it does. But forgetting about that, engineering as a whole is a principled, is a principled um, science, let's say, right? Or is a principled undertaking. It has a set of principles, out of that we go. We wanna build a bridge, we have malleability, elasticity, uh, conductivity, you know, false work, representability, whatever those principles are, we're gonna define how we're gonna build a bridge based on those, right? So let's look at the tinkering tools first and why we like them, right? Which will be sort of obvious, right? Like Legos. 
We like them because they allow us to take these like objects of representation, these abstract things, and do stuff with them very quickly, right? We're able to quickly iterate, we're able to quickly to manipulate these inherent abstractions, and out of that we're able to quickly postulate and create hypotheses, right? If these Lego blocks are perfectly made geometric shapes, we can put them together, make some squares out of that, and come up with a Pythagorean theorem, right? Phys totally physically. If these, um, if these abstractions are purely algebraic, maybe we're able to manipulate that algebra and come up with a Pythagorean theorem again, right? Depending on how, how we look at that, right? And the, and, the, and the importance of that is that out of that sort of science comes out. That's sort of the general flow of science, unless you're like Ed Witten, who probably doesn't do any of that and he just does the latter. Everyone else who is more or less mortal and human will go through some sort of a process like this, right? And if you ever do science, and if you ever think about um, how science kind of fits together for the most part, it's really that way of taking sort of useful abstractions, creating hypotheses, testing them out of that, and then arriving at some sort of a theory, right? So that's, that's a really important part. It's also a really important part of even things that don't arrive at theory, right? And don't, don't arrive at science, right? So, so let's, you know, let's think for a second about how, how that could possibly look. So I'm gonna see if I don't break my neck. So, so suppose that we're gonna pick, um, I'm gonna randomly generate a data set here. It's gonna have a thousand samples, it's fine. Let's add some more features, that's kinda cool. Get a little bit of shift in there. So I'm just randomly generating a data set so we have something to work with, uh, as you can imagine. And then let me, uh, it's a little hard to do the mouse thing from here. And then let me pick a, pick a classifier, right? So pick a decision tree classifier. So this is the API of the underlying basic decision tree classifier in Python sklearn, right? The nice thing that I'm able to do is right away I'm able to see what it is, right? I don't have to go to documentation. I don't have to do some sort of inference. I don't have to do anything. I can just see it and see if it's the thing I care about, if it's the right one. If I can ask questions that are immediate, I can just say like, what is this? Oh, it's that, okay. And then I can just alter and change it and get results back right away, right? Now, I'm not, by the way, do not walk away from this thinking this is another machine learning platform or this is another tool. This is just something I built to talk about how we can talk about <laughs> symbolic and semantics and statistics and engineering and that whole thing that we could eventually call media or whatever, right? It's just things, but, it, but it's starting to have some of these kind of tinkering components, right? You're able to tinker. You did something, you get something back. You did something else. Maybe you did it wrong, maybe you did it right, uh, whatever, right? You can find out what you're manipulating. You can go and jump to another one. Here's Gaussian naive Bayes, that actually doesn't have any parameters, so it's not interesting. Here's a uh, multinomial naive Bayes, only has one parameter, cool. I did something wrong. Ah, I got a useful response. It's not going to work with this particular data set because all of my uh, binary inputs are positive. Fine, right? I can go to a random forest. I can do something and say something like that and I get a useful warning that says you didn't have enough trees, right? I'm, whatever I'm doing, whatever I'm working with, I'm only dealing with statistical problems and statistical questions and statistical answers, right? At least fundamentally. Here I increase the number of estimators and it's kind of creeping up there or whatever, right? Does that make sense? Just, just as a way to abstract, just as a way to think about this stuff. So let me go back to the talk. So let's go back to the other tools, right? The other types of tools. So that was kind of, we were tinkering there and that's kind of cool. We love tinkering. So let's look at principle tools, like engineering tools ba based on engineering principles. And let's look at this example. So here's the cantilever bridge system, right? So what is it made to do, right? It's made to do a number of different things, but in particular it's designed to have little false work, right? So which means extra work that you don't need to do when you are actually building the thing, right? Uh, that won't be part of the uh, final structure, right? So if we think of the Empire State Building, they build twice the number of elevators that you currently have in it to build the Empire State Building. So that is a quantifier of the false work there, right? So 
The other part of the cantilever bridge system, the principle that it's lined on is that it's easily reversible. So you can build it, you can take it apart. We think of that as sort of modularity, but there's a different kind of dynamic that we think about there. And by the way, if you are interested in engineering and software engineering as a whole, it's worthwhile to, to look at how people build stuff out in the world, like especially things that shouldn't fall down, right? That like really fall down as opposed to just lose money or whatever. So, so out of these kind of basic principles that are, they're essentially really demonstrated by these guys hanging out, it's exactly that. You, you end up getting a bridge, which is the, for example, the Bay Bridge, if you go to San Francisco, and then you end up taking the bridge down, right? You end up taking, the way that it's taken down and the way that it's put up, it's put up is exactly the same. There's pretty much no faults work in the way that's done, right? It's not a structure that's stacked on itself, right? It's not this, this pinnacle of, of code that if you remove a module, stuff just goes haywire, right? It's not like Microsoft Word, for example. So, and, and, and it also doesn't take like 30 seconds to boot up, right? It is actually incredibly efficient and incredibly fast. You can put that up. Like the, the Empire State Building was built in 13 and a half months, right? And they built all the tools to build it. So something is probably there. And of course, like this entire process, this principled engineering process also feedbacks into science and scientific theory feeds back into that, right? If, you, if you're actually care to think about it that way. And sort of if we think about software, and I put it in engineering, um, in quotes, is that we really, like in software engineering, we really don't have any such principles, right? This is, I think, part of the foundation of why I became interested in these things and kind of took the problem of machine learning as, a, as, a, as an example, really, within that, the realm of software engineering, right? And, you know, there are many reasons why we can discuss why it doesn't have it, but one, one thing to note, and I, at least according to Alan Kay, who was at the 1968 Garmisch conference where software engineering was coined, was that it wasn't actually called software engineering, it was called an, an attempt at engineering, right? Even then, people knew that it was likely not going to be anything that was built on principles, but they would hope, they hoped one day maybe it would evolve in that, and they called it this, then it was co-opted, and then we go around thinking it actually is engineering or has anything to do with this entire flow of science and theory and, and structure and principles and, and that sort of modularity and, and foundation that a bridge needs to have, right? So, food for thought. And, and you know, the other part of it was maybe why we're not reconciling this is that once again, we're, we're kind of doing this tug of war and, or software is doing this tug of war between tinkering and pseudo principles, right? We might define in a certain world like a standard or a set of standards, we might define a framework, but then we're gonna want that framework to be flexible enough, but then we want it to be production worthy, but then we want this, and then we want that, and then we don't arrive at anything that's very concrete, right? Or at least very global. There are exceptions to this. I'm just making generalizations, but I think for the most part, um, people who've written enough code feel that way. Certainly people who've written front end code feel that way. There are not that many people here who write front end code, but okay. Um, and so, you know, the issue here is that I don't think it's a useful tug of war, and I think that it's really a tug of war with itself, right? We, we're really not doing any, any sort of service to anyone, including ourselves, when, when we do it. So, out of that, let's make a definition of what a useful tool is for the sake of this talk, or at least a useful engineering tool, or a useful software engineering tool. Let's call it useful if it allows for both tinkering, right? Let's try to satisfy that, or experimentation as well as extendability or communication with external systems and is formulated on useful object, object abstractions, right? So at the bottom of it, we have already a symbolic system that we've defined as useful. We have a way to manipulate that. We have an interface, hopefully, for it. And then we have a system that, isn't, that allows for fast experimentation, but it also allows for literacy, right? Because it's built upon something that was built for literacy. And it also isn't isolated living in the world out there somewhere. It can still communicate with outside systems, right? So, you know, like think about writing again, right? So if you think about the physical act of writing or you think about the Gutenberg press or you think about typing or you think about all of that stuff, so the combination of language and the tools that is the pen and the paper or the typewriter or the press are useful because they allow for all of this. They allow for literacy and they allow for reproducibility in the sort of 
Walter Benjamin sense of it, or in art any other artistic sense of it you want to you want to talk about, and they also allow uh, for communication right through that reproducibility. But none of that forces the original creator, the original writer, artist, whomever it is, to really be thinking about the technology involved in putting ink down on a pen, right? Or for somebody to be reading it later, right? And 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 you're and you're essentially you know, as you're physically doing that, you, you, you have a system that's interactive, that's visual, and that's symbolic at the same time. That's right, we can write a sonnet, and we're pretty happy doing it if it's good, right? So, um, let's think a little bit more about how that could go down, right? So let's, we talked about a little bit about tinkering, we talked about reproducibility. What if we're gonna add something that allows for some form of communication, right? Well, sorry, it's a little hard for me to see. You know, here I have, if I can, I can basically just download the state, right? So this thing here, let me see if I can jump this out. Right, let me do this quickly for you, which you'll see in the terminal for the hell of it, is the state, which is the arguments associated with that particular setup, right? So I do a whole bunch of work, I can export the state, that can be imported later to another system. It can be given to somebody else. It can be imported back into this when I come back two years later to work on the same thing. Like a very simple way to, just, just the ability to print something that you're doing in this very simple way to ability to save it is already kind of a fundamental way to communicate, right? It doesn't have to be exceptionally sophisticated if I can sort of click that off, right? And it can take you sort of, the, the reason that I'm downloading this thing, right, as a file is not just a gimmick, right? It's not, my, it's not the fact that this is the only thing I can do here. It's the fact that I sort of went from this interface, from this medium that I'm looking at here that I've been tinkering with into something everyone knows, a JSON file, right? A world totally accepted and understood in the APIs uh, interface world of programming, right? That's just a, a simple example there, right? So going back, so, you know, the, you know, where we're kind of arriving here is, is kind of the idea that we're supposed to be combining symbolic representation, some sort of a language we're building. We're supposed to be combining with a tool and really what we're thinking about is an interface to that tool, right? Whether it's a hammer and it has a really long handle so that you can get quite a bit of velocity on the end of it or whether it is a terminal or whether it is a blank sheet of paper, whatever it is, it's, that's really the thing that we're trying to create, right? That's our medium. It's the interface that we're really working with, right? And sort of, you know, you know reading Alan Kay's quote where he says, why spend two weeks reading an MS-DOS, a manual, I think, it's missing there, trying to learn for, for to copy a file or an application, you get nothing from that, much better just design a UI with the user acts as an intermediary from the very first step, right? So why can't we start doing that? Right, maybe in general in programming, but certainly in machine learning. Why can't we start thinking about you know, interfaces where you are already part of the process from the get-go? And sort of going to online documentation or inline documentation or terminal documentation, whatever it is, doesn't get you into the process of doing statistics. It doesn't get you into the process of doing machine learning. Right? It gets you into some other process that you now have to learn about, which has its own validity and its own, and its own power but it's fundamentally not doing the original thing that you started with, right? And sort of the interface is the thing that allows us to manipulate that. It's the thing that lets the language come to life, right? It's the thing that makes you build, right? And sort of putting all of this together, you know, the interface, the tools, the language, you know, we start to think about as media, right? We, we think about this intermediary between this thing in our heads, these ideas that we're trying to do, trying to formulate somehow and trying to functionalize, if we want to use that term, and, and, and the information that needs to be transferred between whatever tools that we're going to be used, using to do that, right? And, 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 it, and while we're doing that, we're sort of creating this, this, this requirement that we want fundamental literacy to be a goal, right? So once again, just think of writing, right? And think about what that allows you to do in terms of thinking about things that you could not have thought of. That's, that's essentially the creati what creativity is, right? So, so think about 
for a second again, like what it is that, that, that's actually happening here, right? right? So like just a very simple example, what, I, what I've created is just a little way to have literacy of the underlying APIs that live in Python, in sklearn, right? I can just jump around, I can do things, you know, I can get some errors, and I have a way to talk about it, right? You can ask me to do things that you probably not, would not have asked otherwise. You could say, you know what, I only care about decision trees. Or you could say, you know what, I only care about random forest, I wanna see how well I can do. And as a matter of fact, let me do something else here, so I can see. I asked for too many features, I guess, right? I can say, great, I can ask a question that would be an actually a fairly complicated question to ask from like a, in a first year, you know, first semester data science question. I can say, student, I can say, I only care about the true positive rate, right? Find me the best configuration, right? There's nothing crazy happening under the hood here. It's just doing a grid search, right? But it's doing a grid search and it's doing it, it's allowing me to ask that question right away. I don't have to do the whole arch of getting results, tweaking parameters, trying to learn about the API, being unsatisfied with it, going back and then eventually arriving at the decision of what a grid search should be, or an optimized grid search, or whatever it is. Right, I can fundamentally ask that question from the get-go. Moreover, it's something that's aware of the machine, right? There's like this small little thing that's happening there under the hood that's not being utilized right now, but it's the number of jobs, right? Why isn't the interface that I'm working with something that's aware of the number of cores in this thing that I'm working with, that's aware of the elasticity of the compute, right? Why do I have to add another layer of sort of confusion and, and, and work in order to arrive at something so basic, right? So, so I can ask these sort of fundamental questions. I can also ask questions about what if I wanted to pick a model that was out of this world? Right, pick best one, best configurations. That's potentially a useful question, right? Or I can ask one about ensembles, right? What happens if I combine this one and that one? Or this one and this one? Or this entire block and that entire block? Or all of them, or any of them? Or what happens, what should be here? Or what should be here from a structural standpoint? Right, I'm, some of these questions will make sense, some of them won't make sense, but at least I can ask them and I can see where that will take me, right? back and sort of you know another way kind of looking at this is is kind of in a broader scope of, of evolution of computing right because these machines originally were made to do exactly this right they're made to do numerical calculations and if you look at kind of the broad idea of that story is that you know here's you have the ENIAC in 1946 with uh, you know Betty Snyder and Glenn Beck that are kind of programming there. Here you have the IBM Fortran machine in 1970, and here you have my a screenshot of my you know screen from whatever last week or something. And you can ask the fundamental questions like what's actually changed, right? What what is actually fundamentally different in this process? The graphics are better. Cool. We have an editor that looks nice. Fine, but we're still sitting there and like typing characters using a keyboard, which could be known as a teletype, into a screen in this completely um, sequential way into a medium that's un unaware of the machine that we're on, right? I mean, this was designed, you know, this, this IBM punch card machine and the rest was designed to be that way. The keyboard and that whole thing by von Neumann and all of those guys thinking about an Eckhart because the machine was that way. They were dealing with a single core, sequential computing, no threads, maybe some onboard memory stuff, right? That's why it made sense to make punch cards out of with this thing called a keyboard, push them in, have it run sequentially, and then, and then, and then move on, right? So, you know, we can ask like fundamentally what it is that's happening that we're doing that's, that's so different, right? Some things are definitely different, but not, but not I think, as much as you think. Um, so, right, you can ask that. And we can ask what would happen if we were to talk to these guys and have them redesign the computer from the get-go. Like give them this laptop and ask them what would be the interface that they would create for it. What would be, what, how would they, would, would they think about that media? Would they come up with the same 
you know, a TTY terminal, right? And if you guys use the terminal, right, TTY stands for teletypist, right? So, I mean, this isn't, you're, you're using something that's fundamentally, that thing that I threw the JSON file on is made to emulate something from like 1948, right? It should be like the best possible emulator of something from 80 years ago, where we're fundamentally not working on machines that are functioning like machines from 80 years ago. We have completely different questions and, and restrictions and paradigms, right? Um, and um, so, let's see where I want to go with that. Okay, said all of this. And then, and then the next sort of question that we want to ask is where do we want to go with this in 10, 20, or 30 years? Like if we were going to sit down and design all of this from scratch, right, what would these tools look like? Like what if we were just going to imagine it? Right, just forget about everything you know, which is, was the world of the 1940s and, and these, these people, and try to do it again. Like, what would it be, right? And, you know, if we try to do that, essentially we're going to come up with something that is, it, we're going to come up with a question, the immediate question of whether software engineering should be part of that. Should it be a primary tool? Should it be a, some, a secondary tool? Should it be a lower level extension tool? Should we, in, should we allow you to integrate into other environments that are not like quote unquote software engineering environments, right? But whatever these tools are that we're gonna create, we should probably at least do something like minimize false work in the engineering thing, right? We should think about something that's gonna make you at least focus on the problem you care about in the language of the problem you care about and, and that. Um, and so, when we design that, you know, what should the design look like? What is the UX, right? Not necessarily UI, but what is the UX of the underlying framework, right? Well, you know, should it be a screen or a keyboard, or an entire space or a room? You know, we should think about feedback, like we saw there. And we should really think about the fact that generally we pose problems by giving a state description of them, but we solve them by providing a process that arrives at that state, right? So how should we capture that? right, as, as, a, as a natural thing. So whatever that is, whatever these tools and design is, we, they should at least maximize literacy, right, well, that is. And, and we shouldn't be a think, afraid to think of design in a global sense. I mean, here's the nav lab self-driving car from the 80s, which I believe drove from New York to DC on its own at some whopping speed of 25 miles an hour. But this was an entire lab that was designed to do machine learning. That whole thing is just, you know, is just stuffed with monitors and computers and all of this stuff and operating systems that they wrote to, and, and, and hardware they put together to do that. It's an entire lab to do a specific machine learning task, right? You know, should it look something like this? Maybe seems silly and, and, and superficial, but if you ask guys like Brett Victor, he's actually building stuff like that, right? He's not necessarily building it for machine learning or for engineering or for any of these sort of things. Maybe he's thinking more about architecture right, or other kind of medium, but, you know, the, the power of sort of extrapolating yourself from just this medium right here is, I think, something worth at least thinking about, right? And sort of the bright side of all of this for us is that it's just really not that hard and not that expensive to do what we're trying to do, right? We're not building, like, really complicated things, right? We're not building things that, that require an incredible amount of machinery. Right? Like some guys could sit down and write a piece of software that doesn't cost anything except their time. A lot of the hardware doesn't cost that much now. You can program your own FPGAs, right? I mean, it's on Amazon, right? You can, you can even manipulate hardware to a level. And then you can even think about process. So for example, just as a last little thing, like if I want to do all of this and I want to share with you what it is that I did and I want to understand the process of how I arrived at that, why not add time travel or session logging or completely stateful abilities that you can manipulate and share and compact and, and serialize and then later recreate and log and all of that. It's a totally trivial idea that's been around for a while, but, but why not have that be as the fundamental part of the underlying API, right, of the underlying system? Because that's inherently what we're doing, right? So, you know, maybe it's worth rethinking engineering design, right? Maybe it's worth rethinking some of these things that we're, that we're working on. Maybe it's worth thinking about statistical libraries as something that's gonna go out of the world of the terminal, to go out of the world of the command line, 
into other media, like this thing is just jumping out into the browser. Right? Maybe it's worth thinking about operating systems again. Maybe it's worth sim thinking about specificity. Right? It's not that expensive. It's really not that hard. And people build specific, crazy, complicated shit all the time. That is much more complicated than anything we're really talking about. I mean, this is like the tes every Tesla factory robot and the operating system and the software required to do that is much more complicated than some sort of a visionary thing that I haven't even thought of in this realm, right? Or, or any of you. At least that's, that's my feeling to it, right? Um, you know, so there's a whole bunch of bright sides and a whole bunch of bright sides of thinking from pr first principles. Right? And the other sort of important piece, and I know that we're running up to an hour here and I want to give people time for questions, is that the one thing that's different from, say, 20 or 30 years ago is that we have this universal format. We don't have to build isolated tools. You can build a mechanical computer, and as long as it can hook up to a wire and send an ele electronic signal or across in a standard format, it is by definition not, not, not isolated from the rest of the world. Right? That did not exist. So somehow in engineering or in software design and machines and all of that, somewhere along the 80s, we stopped building specific tools and decided to build these gigantic mountains of stuff. Right? But the reality is that there was a lot of utility in building specific tools and there was a lot of sort of proven, you know, proven utility in doing them but it was a lot harder then than it is now, right? So there's, there's an inherent, I think, kind of culture that might need to be manipulated or shaken a little bit to do that, right? And sort of last but not least, you know, you hear this, this is a machine learning seminar, there's probably somebody asking you like, what is that? As opposed to the AI or somebody will ask you something like, how, what is deep learning? Is that machine learning? Or some oxymoronic questions that really have no answers because they don't even make any sense. Right, and you'll have this kind of antique hay of squabble between data science and statistical engineering and machine learning and AI, whatever that is now, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe all of that is really just moot from our standpoint. Let the marketers figure that crap out, right? Well, we should just think about the interface and we should think about the media itself, right? We should think about the problems we're trying to solve and you know, the, the world we wanna create in solving them without being facetious about it, actually writing the code and building the things and making, making the projectors and rooms and, and touch screens or whatever it is that needs to happen. And, forget, and let everyone else deal with that. And I think in order for that to happen, you're gonna have to have a whole bunch of people together who are thinking from different points of view. And I think these are some of the domains that are, are important, but it's certainly not the extent of them. And all of these domains, if you haven't read Herbert Simon's book, fall into what he calls the sciences of the artificial, which includes economics and a whole bunch of other things. But, it, but it's really worth, um, worth taking a look at that. The book is called Sciences of the Artificial. And so here's a few people I wanna just outright, um, you know, say thanks to, some of them are dead, some of them are alive, some of them are very much alive in here. So, you know, if you haven't, if you don't know about the guys at the top and you're interested, please look up their talks, papers, and so on. Email me, I can, tell you things there. Some of them are back from the beginning, some of them are still around now. Uh, I wanna thank Eric Gade, who's here, and Tom Nyberg, with whom I work. We've had to listen to this stuff for some time now, but have provided a lot of the input and a lot of the content that you, that you see here today. And then I just wanna end with a quote by, by J.C.R. Licklider, right? Where he was imagining a machine that was able to do numerical computation. He was imagining what a digital computer would be soon enough. And, and this is what he said. He said, the modeler observes through the screen and oscilloscope selected aspects of the model's behavior and adjusts the model's parameters until its behavior satisfy his criteria. To anyone who has had the pleasure of close interaction with a good, fast, responsive analog simulation a mathematical model consisting of mere pencil marks on paper is likely to be static, lifeless thing. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Go ahead, though. So when you, you know, you pulled up your, your page. Yeah. 
Sure. That's right. That's right. Sorry, I'll repeat the question if people can't hear. Yeah, so I, so, so I guess it's not a question, it's an observation, right? So the observation is, or the analogy, right, yeah. is, is to electronic music production, right? So in the GUI that, that we were looking at here, and it really is a GUI, right, for now. I mean, there's a bunch of stuff under the hood that I can tell you about. But it is, is, you know, somehow can be related to, say, an electronic music GUI, right? And, and the power of the electronic music world and the electronic music sort of programs and the utilities of them is the fact that people aren't doing programming even though there's a whole bunch of programs. Photoshop is another example, right? You're able to manipulate fairly sophisticated things through the medium that you care about, where in the medium of electronic music, it's music, right? And through the medium of Photoshop, it's a photo photograph, which is actually 2D and you're cool with that being on a screen, right? That's an important part. And maybe you'll make some cool mouse, mice, mouses, you know, touch pads or whatever, to make your interaction more physical with it in the same way here. I mean, it's also like, to your point, you can ask a more fundamental question like of a keyboard. A keyboard has been around for a long time, but it's fundamentally a different interface to instruments from the harpsichord, to the organ, to the, to the well-tempered clavier, to electronic stuff. They're totally different in instruments, but the interface and the media, it stays exactly the same. There's a reason for that, right? Sure. I agree. When you couldn't have the, the well, you know, the, the, the fully key piano without tempering the clavier, right? Without having figured out what all of those, uh, uh, you know, frequency uh, routings have to be, right? So, I mean, I'm, I'm not exactly, it's definitely true that this can't exist without all the underlying technology. I'm not saying sure what that's saying. Um, I'm not postulating the fact that technology or like engineering or writing code or any of these things can be removed from the process of doing anything statistical. I think it will always be there, right? It has been there since the 40s. The question is how we formulate that, right? How we create the, the keyboard to do it, right? Um, I'm also not saying that you're not going to program. This is not a this is not something that you know you can go and, and here's like a platform to do machine learning without knowing anything about machine learning or coding. It's not about that. Maybe coding is an integral part of this, right? And Brett Victor, for example, has a whole bunch of video games where he has um, a text editor that is totally dynamic. It's like imagine a, a hybrid between this GUI and a text editor, where you, within the text editor you can manipulate every single parameter totally pseudo-physically, and that changes the way the video game. Uh, plays out, you know, that sort of stuff. There could be a hybrid world. You know, one thing that I sort of didn't say for the sake of time is that, like, we're in many ways very close. Like, so we, we come up with a lot of these standards, right? They're not principles, they're standards. So think of PEP8 in Python, right? So it's like telling, there's a standard of how you're supposed to write documentation, there's a standard about how you're supposed to write your program. It's, it's mostly a syntactical standard so that it doesn't look like a mess and we can go from one to the other. But that, that standard is pro, at least for, let's say for documentation, it's, is given essentially so that you can write and run another program and convert your documentation to HTML. There's a parser that goes in, it creates nice, it, it's it marks up your documentation, then you can publish it to the web. And that's cool, but, but isn't that somehow insane? Because you're trying to, you're forcing people to write in a standard something that is unstructured by definition. Why not just structure it and then have a base class method that generates the HTML from that structure? 
For example, you write your documentation as a div or some other natural structure there. Because essentially to make this work, and by the way, there's nothing hard coded here. When I press these buttons and I do all of this stuff, this is all auto proceed. I mean, it's, it's, there's no, it's not like I wrote down the API for every single function and all of that. Right, I just wrote something that actually parses this documentation and does a bunch of functional and method inference in order to create a structure that, that sits on top of tep8 to do this. But imagine that Python started with that or imagine that Python did web components. Like every single thing you wrote would just immediately pop up as an option here. And you wrote that in code. You said, I'm gonna write an sklearn class with all its methods. I'm gonna follow all the structure and all of that. I'm gonna deploy it to my live network. It would just pop up right there. You're good to go. You wrote the code. Why do you have to write the code again, you know, in some sense? Does that answer your question? Yeah, I mean, I was very quick. Okay, well, I, and I was very long, so it works out. Sorry, I'm gonna go. Go ahead, man. Yeah, well, that's the point of specificity, right? No, I know, right? Yeah, I can repeat the question. The question is really about the fact that you, if I can reformulate it and you correct me if I'm wrong, okay? So, you know, in the world of machine learning or statistical engineering, people are coming from different, different directions, right? You might have biologists, you might have mathematicians, you might have, you know, uh, sociologists, whatever, right? They might need a, comp a different, tools, essentially a different view, a different video for their different approaches, right? And, and sort of, you know, a defining a GUI like this is certainly not gonna satisfy that, nor any GUI, by the way, at all. I'm not proposing that. It's, I mean, I think that, that we're in agreement, right? My, my point is that, yes, that's absolutely true, and I think we shouldn't be afraid to build, and we should think about building tools that solve specific problems well. I mean, I don't, I, th I don't want to be, no, I'm not, I'm not that, um, uh, so the question is, you know, are, are, is the current, th is the status quo somehow a drag for innovation, right? Like the way things are right now. No, I mean, I'm not that, uh, uh, I don't want to be that derogatory. I mean, I don't think that's true at all. I mean, there's a lot of great things that are happening. I think that, I think that the better way to say it is that do you envision doing things the same way in 50 years? Right? Or do you envision the amount of progress that you've had between the 1970 Fortran way of programming to the way you do now, that sort of incremental progress when viewed in comparison to the progress of computing in general and of processing and of scalability and, and elasticity and, and all of these things we know about. Do you expect that same rate uh, uh, differential to continue in, in, in from 50 years from now. You know what I mean? Are we going to make as much progress in how we do things as we've made in the last 50 years when you look at it, say, you know, normalized by the amount of progress we've had in what the underlying uh, machines are that we used to do these things? Does that make sense? Go ahead. seems more like 
yep. that are writing a whole basic machine learning model to use our model. Like, here it is, check it out. Yep. And then I think on the other side of it, here's years ago, start, you know, kind of describing what he envisioned as literate programming, yep. where natural language, which is basically the most fundamental thing early on in the whole way of what you're describing, yep. describing the natural language, make the natural language itself compile into a program, almost seems like you don't even need to abstract it at that point. It's more like just get something that can kind of reverse engineer, you know, go the other direction. Go back to natural language and say, how can we convert natural language into what we want to do? And then whatever existing algorithms, just pick up the best of them and then implement that to that part of the sequence of things that you need to do. Okay, so I'm not gonna re make a synopsis of that for everyone else. I hope you heard it, but um, I'll see if I can do it in, a, in, in answering. Ask questions. No, that's fine. So, um, so first of all, when I think when I say language or semantics, I don't necessarily mean natural language in the, in 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 the realm of sure. right. We don't have to be married to that. But it, it, it is to some extent the most readily available thing that it is the thing that that that's why we're having this conversation, right? It is the thing that's having the neurons fire and then you're telling me stuff and I gotta respond. Yeah, yeah. that's the thing. I agree, we're, we're, we are built for it, yeah. but, but we are built for manipulating it too. And we're built for refining it as well, right? And when we refine it, that refinement doesn't have to be, doesn't have to fall into the category of natural language. I mean, it's a linguistic question that you're asking me essentially, right? It's a question of symbolic linguistics. Right, and so, you know, I'm not, you know, we could have a Knuth like, we're gonna take, write LaTeX everywhere, or we're gonna have cool machine learning, right? We're just gonna write integrals. And by the way, SumPy does that, right? There are, there's an interface API to Python that you could do like Lee groups, and you can do symbolic integrals, and you can write the LaTeX in there, and it's cool, and as does uh, Wolfram, so, okay. right? And, and, and I have nothing against that, and I think that's great. I just think that maybe we can go further Maybe we don't have to write it, or maybe we don't, we can manipulate it in other ways. Maybe we can abstract like classes of I, these things. I 100% agree with yeah. the idea of like, by putting all the existing stuff into kind of a periodic table, you can see what's missing all the stuff. You sure. Can see but that's just, just a gimmick. Yeah, but I'm, I'm saying I, I agree with the concept yeah. of that. There's more out there, and when you see directly the implementation, yeah. you can learn much more than what you currently have. Yeah. So maybe I don't understand your question then, or maybe it's a comment. My point was that the, the way that you want someone to manipulate things to see the connection, Yes. the ability to have that conversation with someone else or with the machine directly yeah. and understand your language and can do the same type of thing, yeah. it almost seems like natural language would be the easiest interface. Sure. I. I'm not sure I agree with that. I think that's just a question of problems, right? I mean, like, okay, let's, let's forget about machine learning. Just think about architecture, okay. right? People who do architecture are inherently thinking in a three-dimensional world. They're thinking about spaces, human relations to spaces. Maybe they're thinking about some sociological stuff, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, what would you imagine a tool to do architecture be? Would you imagine it to be a three-dimensional, you know, a, a program that has by made by engineers who realize there's such a thing as perspective and landscape and like coded that in into a flat screen and made your keyboard do it? Or do you imagine that there's a better way for them to think about that in general? Like a space to think about space, right? Now, is, is that solution a natural language solution or is it a purely symbolic solution? I don't know, I don't know what the boundary yeah. is. I just don't know. Okay. Yeah, I mean, and like, I mean, I fundamentally don't know. And I agree with you, you know, and I agree with Knuth, and I, and I agree with Wolfram, even though he's crazy. But, but I don't know, like, you know, uh, I also agree with Brett Victor, who probably wouldn't agree with you. 
in some ways, right? I mean, there's, I, think that, I think it's a question of problems where you're defining it. Like you can go with the same, like people do machine learning in, in medical world, right? They're fundamentally thinking about something that's statistical and medical at the same time. Maybe that could have a more physical representation. You know what I mean? Like yeah. thinking, you know, so I, I don't know. I think, I just think it's not that hard to experiment with this stuff. Like you can build more than these GUIs. It took me two weeks to code or three weeks or whatever part time. You know, you, you can build 15 GUIs like this and then you can build some objects or you can do what Brett Victor is doing with where he's building full spaces to do stuff, to do engineering. You know, that with like, oh, I don't know what's there I don't know, right now, but you know, the visions of like holographic projections and stuff like this you know, in that minority report way. But I don't know what the language should be. Yeah. Sorry, you, you had a question out. Yeah. Sorry, last, last two questions, but I'll be around in this beer. Yeah. Um, you introduced um, a few concepts that are not typical in, uh, in a technical presentation of this nature. Yeah. Yep. has a user experience. And this is pointing to, I think the nature of my question is, as you're asking the question about what we're looking at decades into the future, what, to what degree, to what role is a marketing concept like critical mass, critical adoption, important in, in either a narrow sense for a technical tool set high-end Photoshop users, right? Kay. Very specific, very technical. And to what sense is it important in a broader sense uh, for, let's say, general purpose computers? Okay, that's a, that's a, that's a pretty loaded. Uh, you don't want to start it. No, I brought it up. That's fine. So I'm not going to answer it in full or, or what I think about it because there's a lot there. You know, you want to talk about Steve Jobs, you talk about Alan Kay, they're all together. It's a big story. So. My, my point is, um, is that I, I guess uh, I'm not so much, I think that, um, you know, there's always, there's always a discrepancy between the market and, and, and innovation, right? They're not always aligned. And, um, you know, I kind of have an inherent faith in the development community to be innovative, at least some part of it. Right, and to be uh, agnostic of the market, at least for a while. Right, and, and personally I feel like what should happen is that I think companies who have money should create labs to do things like this, or universities, because that's not expensive. You're not creating very expensive labs to do this. It's not expensive research, which it, like they did with Xerox PARC, right? I mean, you had 12 guys, and there's a bunch of examples, IBM Labs, Xerox PARC, but here you have 12 guys who created like in four years, six, seven, eight things, sure, they're really smart, but you can find 12 smart guys out there, you know, thinking about this, this stuff, I think. And they created like six or seven trillion dollar industries out of that. The market understood it. Xerox didn't understand it, but the market did. But they weren't thinking about it. And that's why the lab was, they weren't thinking about the market. That's why the lab was shut down, even though Xerox built an entire business on laser printing for the next 45 years until, you know, it's disaster of what's happening with it now. So, I don't know, you, we can talk about that, but it requires more beer. Yeah, one last question. Yeah. Um, 
So the question, yes. Yeah, so the question is, have I thought about a specific example where something like this could work? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, you know, we built a company based on that. It's not a machine learning company, right? It's a company that deals with people interacting with large volumes of documents. It's kind of an archival system thing. And we thought of that from, I guess, bottom up in, in your definition. And I can show you some of those things. So I've been thinking some aspects about this for some time. It's just I've been starting to kind of congeal some of these ideas coming from different places and listening to people who thought about these things before, you know, the iPhone and stuff like that. Anyway, I, um, I'm going to stop now because I have to. But any, I'm here and you have my email, I hope. Please email me with whatever questions. So thank you.